Morgan Luttrell, I don't know uh, Marcus, but I know his brother, also uh, in, in teens. Um, I'll answer that question, Dave, but why, 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 why on earth would you put somebody through that? Everything you just saw, that, that was from breakout at the beginning of Hell Week, and then those were pictures and videos throughout those six days, which is just a small slice of, of what Bud's training is. But why, why, why would you put somebody through that? Any ideas? Put them through worse possible situations when they get in a bad situation, suffer worse from the experience, and don't panic. Yeah. Yeah, that's part of it. What else? Minor threat. Ian you McKay. You get them to work as a team? Working together as a team. Absolutely. That's also a big part of it. To strengthen their mentality or their mental. To strengthen their mental like fortitude yeah. or whichever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so that I think is kind of closest to the key. What we try to do with guys in Hell Week is get all these guys that come into SEAL training and they're like some of the best of the best, right? You get everything from a pro hockey player or a pro football player to a triathlete to maybe somebody, a guy that wasn't an athlete but he did CrossFit for the last 10 years of his life or whatever. You get all these guys to come into this training and then they're all incredibly, incredibly talented. But one of the things you learn in Hell Week is everybody has a breaking point. I don't care how much of a stud you are or stud at that you are, everybody has a breaking point, okay? The whole point of Hell Week is when you go into that and you, 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 you have this threshold, everybody has this threshold of what they think they can do physically, right? If I ask you how many push-ups can you do right now, if I ask you to get on the ground, how many could you do right now? Just give me a number, it doesn't matter. 30. 30, all right. Everybody has a threshold in their number of what they can do. How many times can you lift that log above your head? How many times, how long can you spend in cold water before your body starts to go hypothermic? Everybody has a threshold, right? And I'm here to tell you, and that training's here to tell you that no matter what you think your threshold is, that number you just gave me, I guarantee you 100% is wrong, okay? You can do more than 30. If you think you can lay in the Pacific Ocean with no neoprene for only 20 minutes, I say wrong, you can go longer than that. Anything that you mentally or physically put as a threshold, you can go more. You understand what I'm trying to say here? And when you go through Bud's training, you go through Hell Week, you, you're exposed to all these things where a lot of people immediately meet their threshold and then they quit. And those are not guys that we want in the teams. We want people, it has nothing, it has very little to do with physical strength, right? It's, it's mental strength. Because if you can get past that mindset that you can only do 30 push-ups and realize that you can do more, that's the beginning of the success. So what's Hell Week like? Nobody knows when you go through, other than what you hear about from other students that have been through it ahead of you, right? So you have on a white t-shirt. You saw all the guys with the white t-shirts? Later on, after you finish Hell Week, you're given a brown t-shirt, right? So you're always going and approaching the brown shirts. Hey, man, what was Hell Week like? What, was it, what, what did they do for breakout? But, and a lot of it is kind of kept secret and close hell because that's part of it. But it's all about exposing you to extreme discomfort so that you can work through what you thought your thresholds were, right? So th there's a lot of parallels with this to life, right? There's a lot of things that you might want to do in life someday, or you think you might want to do, that right now freak you out. And <coughs> when you come out of this training, what you realize is, there's freaking nothing in life that you can't do if you put your mind to it. And Dave, I'd say in, in general, in the whole, the whole Bud's experience, you come out of that and you realize, wow, I can do anything, anything I want, anything I put my mind to, all right? So Hell Week sucks physically, but it's harder mentally.
that make sense? What questions you got on Helwig before we talk about other stuff? What is the most difficult thing for you in Helwig? Because I, I watched a lot in, in, in different Navy SEALs I've asked have different answers. What was like your kryptonite? I think that's what they go, my kryptonite. What was your Be, Being associated with this guy. <laughs> that's my waterfall dude. <laughs> His swim buddy. Dan, his Dan was my swim buddy in Buds. We were in the same Buds class. So I, I, yeah. I, I, I see. <laughs> He'll be a guest speaker later. He was my water polo teammate at Golden West. They were swim buddies. You yeah. had a swim buddy at, at Buds. No, I'm just joking. Dan's an incredible, he's an incredible American. But uh, for me, uh, it depended on the day. Um, I think the hardest thing mentally is to not think about the whole enchilada and to break all of that pain and suffering down into not days, not hours, but like almost for me, uh, minutes. What about like an evolution? Like, if I can too much? make it through the next minute oh. of this evolution, then I can probably make it to the next minute. If I can make it to that minute, then maybe I can make it to the end of this evolution because usually the evolutions don't last more than an hour to two hours, depending on, on what you're doing. So making those, those little mental notes of um, just making it to the end of an evolution, that's a good way of doing it, and breaking it down minute by minute. Because something really might suck if you're looking at, oh, I don't know, college for four years, but if you can break that down by class, and if you can break it down from class to by exam, by class, it, it's much easier to absorb things that might be overwhelming initially. When you look at, when you walk across the quarter deck of buds initially, you, you have six months of complete suck ahead of you. And that freaks people out. And a lot of them will ring the bell. You saw them, you guys ring the bell three times. If you ring it three times, you're done. You're dropped from the train. You take your helmet off, put it on the ground. Um, Um, so I was going to ask, one of the things during Hell Week that you might not know is the sleep deprivation and that you guys actually have been so much sleep deprivation that you start hallucinating. When you had your breakout on Sunday, I'm guessing, afternoon or evening, when was the first time you actually got to sleep and then how long was that? So... The whole class is broken into boat crews, and the boat crews are set up by uh, height. So you have the Smurf boat crew, that's the six shortest guys in the class, all the way up to the tallest boat crew. I was in the tallest boat crew. Um, if your boat crew does really well in an evolution, then you're rewarded, all right? And that's true all through buds. But in Hell Week, the best reward is to get a couple minutes of rest and maybe a, a couple minutes of shut eye if you have enough time. Um, the first sleep. The first time our boat crew slept, we didn't win in the evolution until I want to say like the second or third, maybe the second day. And um, but it was only like five five minutes or so sitting off on the uh, on the sand berm and the sun was up so I remember it being warm and it was just like oh god nobody's gonna bug us for five minutes this is off and the next thing you remember is somebody's kicking your feet like wake up get on it so you know we got just a couple minutes of sleep so we're talking um, Sunday to Monday Monday to Tuesday most likely before you right and you're and you're constantly getting smoked or whatever you yeah you're, you're constantly on the move you go from evolution to evolution and you saw the guys, uh, this right here, the boats carrying the boats. So you have to move from evolution to evolution. And one evolution might be a half mile away from the previous evolution. So your boat crew picks the boat up, put it on your head, and walk to the, or jog to the next evolution. And, uh, and it's just go, 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 go. And they feed you four or five times a day. Uh, so there's no lack of food. But it's really quick. You go into the cafeteria, you shelf down food as quick as you can, and you're off and running to your next evolution. If your boat crew sucks and you guys never went at any of the evolutions, you might go the whole six days uh, with no sleep. If you have a really good boat crew, 
uh, you could go that whole six days and maybe have an hour or two of sleep over the course of six days. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter whether you had 10 minutes of sleep or two hours of sleep during those six days. Everybody goes through the same level of, of suck. Because I, I would say, I would actually almost argue that in some ways it's better to not get that sleep because once you experience once your body experiences some sleep now it's like your your brain's jelly man all you want is to go back to sleep but if you never get that you just keep powering through powering through powering through your your body adapts to that your body has the incredible ability to adapt to anything whether it's heat or cold or no sleep um, I mean, of course, that's incredibly unhealthy for you. Sleep is really important, but there's no better way to really peek behind the curtain and see what's really going on with you than to deprive you of sleep. So if I don't let you guys sleep for the next 24 hours, I'm gonna learn a lot about every one of you during that 24 hours when you have not been allowed to sleep, right? So we want to we want to know the, the guys that are in the class. You know, are these people we really want in the teams? Are they true teammates, right? Who said team? Teammates. Think learning about teams. Is that you? What did you guys say? Yeah, my friend said. Um, that's a key piece of it. But everybody knows that going into buds, right? It's like, oh, well, you gotta be you gotta be a team player. And it's like, okay, it's one thing for you to say it, but when you're deprived of sleep for four, five, six days, if you're a true team player and you're really a team player, it's gonna shine through during that, that period. Sorry, what, I get off topic. What, what was, uh, so I just know that every Navy SEAL that I've ever talked to has hallucinated at some time and they can't even tell me what they hallucinated. Uh, Rack talks about, they were on, um, they, they, they all talk about that around the world evolution, I guess on Thursday that you do. And Rack said that one of his was, he thought the uh, aircraft carrier was JC Penney. Uh, one of the other guys that's come in here, these two brothers came in here, one said that he started looking at the water and he saw uh, like road signs inside the water. And his brother said that he turned around and he saw his brother there, but his brother was like three years younger, it wasn't in buds yet. Right, um, right. And like, uh, like hands coming out of the water <laughs> like monsters and they're slapping the, oh, if you grab like a darker pin, like a purple or a black or something, it's easier to. Okay, oh, so this is Coronado. Oh, I'm gonna answer. I'm gonna answer your question. So I this, do this for you. I this is this Coronado. This is the Silver Strand. This is Mexico. Where are we? We're uh, we're up here somewhere. All right. So this is Coronado. This is San Diego Bay, right? This is downtown San John. Diego. John. This. Is... Oh man, I was having fun drawing. Oh, okay. I'll, 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 Can I draw in that? <laughs> is that a, is this a whiteboard? Yeah. Oh man, that's even better. All right, thanks. Bigger? Okay, so this is fun. Right? Right, I'll move it down. Uh, I'll move it over closer there for you. Thanks. All right, perfect. All right, so down here somewhere. Let's just say it's here. So this X right here. This is the buds. This is the buds compound in Coronado. You have naval amphibious space on this side, and then on this side on the water. Maybe some of you guys have seen it. Uh, there's a big obstacle course with cargo net that goes up like 40 feet or something like that. And this is where Bud's training takes place. The evolution that uh, Mr. Carlson's talking about is called Around the World. So uh, I forget which night it is, but it's late. I want to say it's like the fourth or fifth night. Um, and everybody's sleep deprived, right? And so they say, all right, everybody get in your boats and meet us in the mud flats. The mud flats are way down here. So you get in your boats and you paddle. And it is a long ass paddle. And you paddle. You guys are all over the map, but you make your way along here, all the way under the bridge, all the way down. Where on the way there is the haircut carrier? So if there's a carrier in port on uh, Sir Rack said he thought it was a JC uh, one of the places they put them is, is right is right here. But you also have 30 second 
Street Naval Base, which is all this uh -huh. uh, over here. So he might have been talking about seeing seeing something over there. But so for 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 my boat crew, I'll never forget this dude Durfee we had in our in our in our boat crew. He's like my height, a little taller maybe. And the reason I have these going around in circles is because the, those are all times that we chased Durfee when he would fall off the boat. So we would be paddling along and Durf would fall off the boat. And because he'd fall asleep, he'd just fall asleep and fall in the water. And, hey, come back and get me, man. It's like, oh shit, we gotta go get Durf. And turn around and go get Durf. And, uh, you know, over and over and over and over. And then, uh, so I was the guy steering and, and I would fall asleep and stroke, stroke, stroke. And next thing you know, our boat would be heading out into the middle of the Pacific Ocean until somebody woke me up. Where the hell are you going? Jeez. I was an officer in, my, in, in the class, right? I was the, uh, the class leader for class 213. And um, I, just, I struggled through bugs, trust me. But, you know, so I would fall asleep. Guys on the boats would fall asleep. Everybody would start seen things differently because when it when when it when it's dark out one of the things you're looking for is your you're, there, there's a light out here on this peninsula and they tell you hey just head for this light and you'll 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 see another marker on this peninsula and you know you just make a right and then keep keep Coronado Island on the right side of the boat and you know, it takes hours to do this. I, I wanna say we were paddling, I don't even know, maybe four hours or so, maybe a little less, maybe a little longer. I saw a, uh, I, I saw the Loch Ness Monster out there, was visiting from Scotland out here somewhere. I saw the Loch Ness Monster for sure. I told everybody in the boat crew, and, you know, I, I remember them telling me to shut up, you're seeing things. I was like, what are you talking about? He's right there. But your brain does crazy stuff when you're when you're sleep deprived. Um, but even when you're sleep deprived, keeping whatever your mission is, keeping that front focus, we call it kind of the five meter target. When you go to the range, you have you have targets at 200 meters, you have targets at 100 meters, targets at five meters or 50 meters, all the way up to five meters. You have reactionary targets that come up. And they teach you when your reactionary targets come up and two pop up at the same time, always always kill the front, the, the one that's closest first, and then deal with the next target, right? That makes sense, right? So you're always you're always dealing with that five meter target when you're dealing with, with stuff. Keeping the mission, and the mission in this case was getting to the mud flats, right? So anyway, I could talk all day about about around the world, but it it's just uh, exercise and sleep deprivation and hallucinating. I'm gonna go um, I can race in a minute. So, um, will you tell us a little bit about your? Uh, I got uh, it. The, 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 the. That's my platoon doing uh, some HBBSS Kilo visit boards search and seizure, so that's landing on the back of an amphib, uh, not an aircraft carrier, but an amphibious, uh, big deck amphibious ship, and just working on taking down the ship from a, with a SEAL platoon, but inserting the uh, helicopter, so that's a fast rope insertion uh, method. In general, uh, I kind of, I kind of, don't like this saying on, on some levels because when we're talking about guys that are, now we've been in sustained combat operations for almost 20 years, right? So, you know, I, I don't like saying that quitters never win because there's a whole behavioral high health psychology aspect of things that go on in the teens and in the military in general and guys getting a lot of uh, mental health crisis I think, and we've learned a lot. But when I first went through training, this was something I had in my head, was winners never quit. Just never quit. That's how I made it through training. No matter how hard it got, I just said at the beginning, hey, I might get hurt, I might get rolled for medical reasons, but I'm never, ever going to quit. 
And that's kind of an analogy <coughs> with, with life, right? You guys are all going to be, you're all going to go down a road of something that you think is really hard, whether it's school or physical, or if you're going to go to a fire academy, or some of you want to go in the military, or some of you want to go to BUDS, you know, just go into that experience knowing that you're not going to stop, you're not going to quit. You might have somebody reach in and say, dude, you're not, you're not a fit for this organization, you're out, whether it's a job or whatever. But uh, just go in knowing that if you have your mind set on something, you, you never have to quit at anything, right? I guess that's the whole point of why I'm here today is to just tell you guys, whatever you put your mind to, whatever the hell it is you want to do with life, just do it, man. Don't let anybody get in your way. I have people telling me, because I have a medical condition, I have people telling me all through the Air Force Academy, right? I went to the Air Force Academy for four years. I have people telling me that I was not medically qualified to go to the Air Force Academy, but I just kept at it. At the Air Force Academy, I had guys telling me I'm not qualified to join the Navy. Then I got in the Navy. Then in the Navy, I had people multiple times telling me I'm not physically qualified to go to BUS. And you just say, you know what, I hear that's what you're saying, sir, but I want to keep trying and keep trying and keep trying. And eventually your tenacity and perseverance shines through and people are going to give you what you want. When they see how bad you want something, you can get it. You're always going to run into people and say, oh, you can't do it, man. The regulations say this. Well, guess what? Every regulation, right? Every rule, there's an exception to every rule. Right? You can always find, in the military, we call it a, uh, an exception to policy. So the policy was a guy with a back like mine can't go into the SEAL teams. So I just had to find the right doc. It was like, no, this guy's a swimmer. He's in good shape. He's going to make it through. I'll sign off on that. But it took me a couple of years to find that guy. Right? You're going to find all kinds of people that tell you you can't do stuff. It's bullshit. Right? Sorry, excuse my French, but sometimes that's the only way I get through Hey, uh, so with the SEAL teams, they're part of the Navy. So we had two bosses in the SEAL teams. We had the Special Operations Command boss. That's a four-star uh, admiral or general, all right? Right now, uh, actually, Tony Thomas, General Thomas just turned over with, uh, forgetting his name right now. But so you have a Special Operations Command boss. And if you're in the Navy, you also have the CNO, the Chief of Naval Operations. So... We are extremely small part of the Navy, okay? This dotted line, that's an administrative chain of command. The solid line is an operational chain of command, okay? So Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, we all have an operational chain of command in special operations under here, but we all also, and it's not designated for the other services, but just to show that we all also have a dotted line to our parent service. So there should also be a dotted line for Army, Air Force, Marines, right? But operationally we work here, administratively we work here. We're only about 2% of the Navy, 26, yeah, 2,600, so uh, that's 700 surface warfare combatant crewmen. Those are our boat drivers. So about 700 of them, um, 2,600 uh, SEALs, and that includes your officers and enlisted. About 500 of those are officers. And then uh, enablers, like our, our, our intel support, our supply guys, our communications guys, those all enable us to do the mission. That all adds up to less than 2% of the Navy. Are the enablers uh, just Navy or do they have to go through some sort of um, specific training to support 